video. So in case it doesn't work. Okay, we're gonna get started. We were waiting for a, a few guests to arrive. So welcome to the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. My name is Carl Dobman and I'm the Dean of the College. This summer I was on the East Coast and I wanted to visit Grace Farms. The website listed an architecture, an architecture guided tour on the day that I planned to go. I signed up and this is where I was treated to an insightful, entertaining and comprehensive tour of the project led by Toshihiro Oki. The tour ended with tea in the cafe, and I wanted to learn more about our tour guide, and we started talking. Led to us being here today, I guess. Toshihiro Oki is an architect. He worked for several years for the Japanese office of Sauna, Sejima, and Nishizawa. He was the local US-based project architect for Sana's US projects, both the Toledo Glass Museum in Toledo, Ohio, and the New Museum in New York City. He also served as an advisor for the construction of Grace Farms in Connecticut. Since 2009, he's been working on his own independent projects in New York. He's taught at Columbia and Princeton and he continues to serve as the architecture advisor at Grace Farms Foundation. Toshihiro took the opportunity to visit the Glass Museum today as he'd not been to, but he had not been back to Toledo since 2010. And I'm curious to hear what he found with his visit today. Toshihiro is Japanese and educated in the US. Beyond being the local project architect for SANA, he operated as translator. In many ways, a project architect is a translator. He was also a translator between Japanese and English, Japanese culture and traditions, and American culture. He translated Japanese architecture ideas of sauna into projects built with American construction techniques. He was also an, an intermediary between established and important architects and their clients with their diverse needs. Often it's difficult enough to translate a design into reality from drawings to physical space. And with Sana's projects, we see this done with a very high level of skill. The issues of translation were fascinating to me and have stuck with me since we were speaking this summer. Our college offers degrees in architecture, interiors, product design, graphic design, and game design with a broad notion of design that unites us in the college, we all rely on others outside our disciplines to translate our ideas into reality. We all work as translators to move our projects from idea to reality. Architects rely on contractors, product designers rely on manufacturers, and graphic designers rely on printers. Each activity requires translation, and as designers, we must be good, be good communicators and translators. Tonight we'll do a deep dive into one building to understand these types of transformations and these types of translations. So welcome to everyone joining online. Welcome to the group joining us from the Glass Museum. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Welcome to alumni, industry partners, and any, any other visitors that are joining tonight. And finally, please help me welcome Toshihiro Oki. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I haven't been in Detroit and Toledo since 2010, so it's, it's really uh, jogs a lot of memories. And um, I will actually go into quite some detail about this building because I think um, there are some interesting facts about it that are not in publications or are also spoken about. Um, and also we have some folks here from the Toledo Museum of Art, so I think that'll give some reason for them to make it worthwhile to come up here. Uh, this is the site of uh, Toledo Museum of Art. You see the old building here, I think it was built in 1908. Next to it, you see the Frank Gehry Building. 
the um, Center for Visual Arts was built in the 1990s. And then across the street in this white uh, trapezoid area is the former parking lot plus a grove of old growth trees that are about 100 and 150 years old. And that's the site where the um, Toledo Museum of Art Glass Pavilion was built. And I'm just gonna go through it and uh, explain how the process worked. Uh, Toledo Museum of Art has quite an extraordinary collection. Um, it has decorative arts, glass, sculpture, works of paper, and it's quite good. I mean, if you haven't been there, you should really go and take a look. And for the glass pavilion, the idea was to have the glass collection, which is actually world renowned glass collections um, everywhere from contemporary all the way back to ancient Egyptian times, to be housed in a new building in order to give that collection the highlight. But Toledo Museum Art also is a very special place because it's free and open to the public, which means that anyone from every walk of life can go there. And that was actually quite unusual for museums of those days and even for now. So there's a very uh, transparent program of wanting to show and allow the public to come in. Um, I pulled up some old photographs of here of school kids who were also part of the program, the educational program, which gave a lot of opportunities to these kids. And I believe from what I understood, a lot of museums actually followed course after this. So there's a very progressive and educational uh, program there. The program for the actual museum, the Glass Pavilion itself, had two completely very different um, uh, programs. One on the, on the left side is the glass collection. And on the right side is actually glass making. And glass making requires molten glass, uh, I think about 3,000 degrees. And you're at the same time exhibiting, exhibiting uh, glass works that are very precious. So to be able to combine them under one roof uh, with having transparent walls is quite challenging. So that was really the program to allow the, to, the, the glass pavilion to come together. The site is uh, across the street from the main museum. Uh, the old growth trees is quite a sight to see, um, to see these kinds of natural growth growing so tall that the intention of the glass pavilion became that those trees would be kept and that the pavilion would essentially like live behind it, live underneath the canopy of the, of the leaves. You can see in this photograph uh, before the, the, the glass pavilion was built that uh, there was an, um, a parking lot there. And further from that parking lot, there's a large neighborhood of Victorian houses, which I believe is one of the biggest in the United States. So there was a, a sensitivity that had to be maintained, a connection to the old Victorian houses through the trees and to the museum itself. Um, early on, there was a kind of mapping of the programs, meaning the adjacency, the programs, and the square footage were mapped out and put together so that they function uh, programmatically for the museum. And there was a kind of a curiosity of how do you connect these programs almost in a diagonal way. So if you connect the corners, you begin slipping and sliding, but yet a larger, let's say, room can be separated into a few smaller rooms, but you're still within the same room because you can actually slip and slide through the corners. But I think at a certain point, uh, to have one curved corner and then another square corner was a bit odd, so, at a, so all four corners became curved, but yet the wall is shared between two spaces. But if a volume or a space had its own walls, it could be even more independent and more s variations of connectivity and separation could happen. So you see sort of the evolution of how these programmatic elements began slipping and sliding, it essentially became like bubbles. The layout that it is now um, on the bottom is the south side of the building. So that's where you have the hot shops and the cafes and the entries, which can take in a lot of direct sunlight. Uh, there is a, 
a Z-shaped foyer. So I don't have a laser pointer, so I can't, so, but I think I can explain. And on the northern side is the actual exhibition spaces, which are more protected just being on the north side of the building. The cavity spaces that are in between the programs actually are more than just separators. They actually began to become the environmental ins insulators that can help separate glass making from glass exhibition. And that was really the driver of the cavities. The floor plan as you see now, you see it in more detail, but on the bottom of the page, you see more of the hot shops and the equipment. And on the upper portions, you see the um, exhibition spaces. So this is how it was built, as it stands now. However, nothing is ever so simple. Uh, there are many, many different uh, variations and schemes that were looked at, uh, just to show a few. But at a certain point, um, Sejima said that there needs to be a, a certain uh, definition to the perimeter, otherwise the design can kind of keep spilling out and have many, many different variations. So she and Isao decided that by creating a defined border, you let the complexity go interior. So that's where the emphasis became. So the exterior of the building is actually more of a rectangle shape, while the interior is where all the complexity is, is uh, driven. Many, many, many different models were made, many different schemes were looked at. This is just a small portion of the, of the schemes. You can see here for study models. And this is an actual model of what's there today uh, in acrylic form. And the other point was that the low slung building lives underneath the canopy. I think that was really the, um, a way to place this program into the landscape underneath the trees while maintaining the views from the Victorian houses back to the museum. So not having a big presence, but more of a subdued presence that is kind of living there among the landscape. Many of the early study models and renderings show how the glass could reflect the surroundings. So the colors of the seasons, the day, morning till night, uh, the greenery, and what kind of atmosphere that would create. The activities that could happen inside as you look out to the landscape. Ideas of how the collection could be exhibited while still maintaining the views to the outside. So here we begin to get a sense of how the programs, you see on this side over here, you see the glass making, and this side over here, you see the exhibition. So that's became the way to merge these two very different environmental programs together, but in a very transparent way. And another idea that was brought in was really bringing in uh, courtyards. So by doing that, you're bringing natural daylight into the middle of the building. And that essentially mitigates the tunnel effect that you get if you have um, bright interior spaces, darker interior spaces. It puts a lot of stress in the eye. It's a, not such a great environment to be in. So these ideas of bringing in natural daylight to give um, a better sense of naturalness and a better sense of the exterior, better sense of the sky, better sense of the environment. And the models also show how the activities would actually take place, because it's not just a diagram, but it's really an atmosphere. It's like, how do you actually live and work in there? How do you make art in there? How do you exhibit art in there? Uh, this model shows how the glass volumes slip and slide past each other. And this is a larger scale model that uh, shows the th 2D plan in a three-dimensional ma uh, manner, and you can see here where you have opaque volumes. Some of them are lamp working or bathrooms. Other ones more on the upper end of the screen are um, exhibition that require more daylight control. And on this side here, there's a multi-purpose space for uh, varying different activities can happen. And then at the upper end of the screen, you s on the north side is where the exhibition spaces are. There are different ideas of how the exhibitions and how the glass objects could be um, exhibited. 
and also more minute details like exactly what's going on in the courtyards, how are the seating arrangement, arrangements in the multipurpose, how is the cafe laid out, what is it like to actually come through the entryway. Because I think as architects you really have to map this out and kind of have an understanding of how the activity works. And that's really, I think, part of the key in making spaces that are functional, atmospheric, that people can enjoy, is these kinds of activities are really thought out. Uh, the site plan shows the, uh, the existing older museum at the bottom. The green area is the landscaping around the site, and the gray is the glass pavilion, which is on access to the entry of the old building. Now this is a, a construction drawing set of the floor plan, so it's actually quite uh, complex looking. So even though the models and the uh, original diagrams looked very simple, there's actually was a lot of uh, thought process and planning that went into it. That same plan with a lot of the notes removed shows where the glass jointing is. The entire building, I'll actually go back here, is on an eight foot grid. And how that came about is two foot eight is the width of the cavity. And that cavity is what allows a union glass cleaner to be in with ladder. Two foot eight times two is five foot four. Two foot eight times three is eight feet. So that two foot eight is then utilized and expanded throughout the entire building. The radiuses were optimized, meaning not too many types of radiuses should be in the construction because then you're basically custom making so many different panels. But yet you want to have, you want to have some sort of um, uh, feeling that it's not repetitive. So there was a balance of how much repeat radiuses do you have and how much new ones do you have to create a kind of optimization. Because the project was $300 a square foot um, back in 2003. Uh, that was really, really low number to hit. So everything had to be analyzed and looked at in order to make that uh, square foot number. And there was no discussion. It had to hit that number and that was it. If you went over, then there's gonna be design cuts. So really as an architect, you really take that as a challenge and how do you hone that um, design so it can really fit that budget so you don't have to make compromises during the construction process. The building is very simple. Uh, it's only a single story above ground, 13 feet with a two foot thick roof. And below ground, there's uh, a full basement. The building total is 76,000 square feet, both up uh, ground level and basement level. The section, there's really one section that's quite important and that's at the perimeter at the cavities. And here you can see the dimension of the two foot eight. That's the dimension that a person can go in, put a ladder out, clean the glass. Uh, it's a concrete slab with a concrete topping. The glass is floor to ceiling. The structure in the roof is really a kind of a Swiss watch type of uh, pancake of all your steel or your um, electrical, or your plumbing, or the sprinkler lines, or the roof drains, every insulation, everything fits in that 24 inches. The cavity space um, that I was talking about before is actually a expanded insulated glass unit. So on this side, you see a typical glass unit, which you see in any typical uh, window. Uh, it has two, pane, uh, two panes of glass separated by either gas or air. So the cavity space at the glass pavilion is essentially that, um, but the airspace is just much bigger. It's not half an inch, it's two foot eight inches. And you can see here, if you go into the cavity, you can see someone standing there or s squatting there taking a photograph. The technical reasoning behind the cavity is that it's sort of the, the active insulation. So instead of, let's say, having um, like bat wall insulation, think of it as, let's say, the blood running through your veins. I mean, that active air is what's insulating from the exterior, 
to the exhibition spaces that are inside. And Toledo, Ohio can get very cold. The, um, the glass making ovens are quite hot. So you have to be able to span that distance with just glass only. The first idea was the pure air storm solution where you blow a lot of air through the cavity. Uh, you can see on this side here, the green. What that meant was we needed 20 air changes an hour and but what that also meant was there's a lot of energy loss through the glass. So yes, it works, but it's not very efficient. The concept that was finally built, um, this is developed by Transolar, who's an environmental engineer we work with. Um, it's called the radiant concept in that if there's radiant heating and cooling both in the floor and in the ceiling of the cavity we're seeing red, the radiation is not really heating up the air, it's heating up the surfaces that is touched. So it's like the sun, the sun radiates its heat. It doesn't heat up the space between the sun and the earth. It only heats up the earth when the radiation waves hit it. So it's a much more efficient way to transmit um, energy. You can heat up the glass surfaces, but not have to heat up the air. And by doing that, you have a lot less energy loss through the glass and the air changes per hour decreases from 20 to five. So what that means is the machinery that's in the basement and the duct size and all that is greatly reduced. So it becomes a way more efficient way to maintain this kind of space. So that's called the radiant concept. Uh, Transar, Transsolar also did CFD analysis to understand what, how the air moves through, um, what was chosen were these um, round grills that have slow velocity air that actually move up like this instead of blowing the air um, in high velocity. And the other um, considerations were daylight because if you have all glass, you have a, a kind of a greenhouse effect. So the mapping of the daylight was really important to understand where the heat gain is. Uh, on the bottom portions of the plants that you see, it did basically what happens is you start way in the morning and then you go to evening. And this is taken at June 21st, which is the, the, um, the height of summer. Um, you can see in the mornings, you do get some daylight coming in way at the beginning of the day. And then pretty much for the full day, most of the galleries are without direct daylight in. So it actually then helps preserve the artwork. And then at the end of the day, you get the daylight coming in on the southern side is where the hot shops and the cafes were. So this is really important to understand where the direct sun gain was coming. IRP also uh, did a foot candle analysis because when you do show Precious artwork, there's a foot candle level that you need to maintain. And this criteria is 30 foot candles. Um, you can see on this chart 30, it's around where the green is. And as you go uh, lower, it goes blue. So that's the safe zone. If you go hotter, it's in the red zone where the foot candle level is too high for the artwork to um, be in that space. So what I did was help us understand how many foot candles are coming in. And in this case, we did know that it actually was above 30. So they ran a calculation of how much transparency is required at the perimeter glass walls in order to maintain the 30. This study showed that it's 10% transparency. What that means is if we have curtains, you have to have it at 10% uh, transparency to maintain that 30 foot candles. The other thing that uh, they and Transolar did was understanding where the curtains, sh where should they be? Without shading, you have 600 watt per square meter of energy from the outside, 380 will come through both panes of glass. If the curtain is on the interior side, interior side of the room, it's already, the, the heat has already passed, so you're actually gaining 350. But if the curtain is in the cavity space, it's deflecting it, so only 30 come in. So that's how you control the actual um, energy transfer from the outside to the inside. That led us to figure out, well, where should the curtains be um, and what transparencies they should be at. So towards the north side of the space, there's a 9% transparency curtain. On the south side of the space, which is where the um, hot shops are, it's at 22% because 
the hot shops and the cafes don't need uh, 30 foot candle levels. We did many mock-ups. We figured out what 9% transparency is. You see that on this side here. So we had to get signed off by the museum um, and signed off by Sejima Nisawa to understand what kind of transparencies are you seeing through the glass in order to maintain the artwork. And hence, construction begins. Um, you can see here when we first started digging, uh, the, you can see the museum in the background. You see how we were beginning to protect the old growth trees. Uh, much analysis was done. Uh, this is basically a soil compression analysis to make sure that the weight of the building there will be safe with, this, with the soil pressures. Uh, these are just some photographs I'll go through. Um, from the neighboring building above, uh, you can look down, you see the footprint of the building and excavation of where the basement will go. Uh, the upper photograph shows being inside that pit looking up and the trees were very, very important. So a lot of effort was maintained to make sure they're protected and sheet piling was put in to protect the roots because we didn't want any of the old growth trees to die because that was really integral to the concept of the building but also integral to maintaining the landscape. The foundation is what's called a mat slab foundation where instead of having footings, you have a monolithic thick foundation. So these are the rebars that are going down. All the elements such as floor drains, conduits and all that had to be mapped out. So when the building was done, your floor drain is where it's supposed to be. Uh, so there was a lot of measurements that were taken and confirmed. Uh, here you see photographs of the foundation walls going up, steel formwork. Uh, you see the, the crews putting in rebar. After the formwork is done, it's pulled out you see the beginnings of the foundation walls for the basement and the columns. The mat foundation is what we're standing on here. After the foundations were done, scaffolding is put up to actually pour the concrete slab for the ground floor. This is just the, well, not just, but this is the structural drawing showing what the slab of uh, the ground floor looks like. It's quite unusual. Uh, the next slide will show you a little bit more. The green is what's called band beams, which is where the actual beams of concrete span throughout the basement with columns below. The white areas in between are one-way slabs, which allows uh, linear floor sides to be cut into it. And that basically is the whole structural system of the ground floor, and you can see the, the outlines of the volume starting to take place. The band beams you can see here, you can see they're sort of kind of crisscrossing all over the place, and I will explain a little bit why that is. Uh, but there was a lot of rebar that had to go in because we really compressed that uh, ground floor slab to get as much strength out of it as possible. You can see the upper photos where the rebar network of craziness is expanding throughout the whole ground floor. The wood is basically the base of the glass volumes. This is where the, where the glass will anchor into, so you begin to see those outlines. Uh, this is just a construction uh, video. Let's see if that works here. Well, let me, I'll do this real quick, so I, oops. So this basically is a typical work day. So Quite a bit of coordination had to happen in order for all the um, band beams and all the glass locations to be in its correct location. So it just goes to show how much coordination is required to actually go through all of this. Um, so this shows before and after. This is where the ground floor slab, the rebar goes down. And then once the slab is finished and the wood forms are pulled up, you begin to see the outlines of where the glass volumes will go. 
I can see here the concrete being poured, the outlines of the multi-purpose room. And this picture is after all that concrete formwork is cured and you pulled all the forms out. This is actually the basement. So I'm looking at the Toledo folks and thinking, this is what it once was. It was a big open cavern of a space before all the machinery and walls were put into place. But here you can see the band beams. That's where you see, that's where the structural beams go and where all the columns are supporting. Uh, now it's fall. So we went from spring, summer into fall. You see the leaves changing. And here we begin the superstructure process where the roof, everything up from the ground floor starts being uh, constructed. Uh, you can see the volumes be starting to take place. You can see the steel beams coming on site. Now the structure of the roof uh, is divided into two components. One's going east-west are the main girders. That's where the main girder beams are and all the columns are supported. Then going north-south are the secondary beams. They're smaller elements. And the reason why the girders are going like this is as the columns got shifted back and forth to fit the plan that was desired, uh, the girders had to move with them. So the girders actually started shifting. The beams that are going vertical can be cut like Swiss cheese. That's where we ran all our utility lines, all the piping and stuff like that, go in that direction. At certain select points, you can actually cut through a girder and that way we simplified the actual, uh, the cutting process. Uh, this is a 3D model showing uh, the girders and the beams over here on this side here, you see a round volume, that's actually plate steel. It's three quarter inch plate steel like at Richard Serra that's curved and creates a volume. And that is actually your lateral brace. So in order to have a roof stay stable, you have columns, but many times the columns are pretty thick and they're actually taking a moment connection. But actually it's kind of wasteful because the column doesn't have to take a moment connection and take both lateral and vertical load. So the columns, in this case, Sajid Munisawa wanted them to be as small as you possibly can make them. So we separated vertical and horizontal load. The columns only take vertical load. So the columns are now, instead of this wide, they become about three and a half inches to four and a quarter inches solid rod, not pipe, solid rod. You pin the top so that if the roof moves, the tr forces don't transfer. So now all of a sudden the columns are very, very, very small. The lateral load goes into the rolled steel volume on this side and the roof is divided into quadrants. On this side here you see some lateral bracing that's hidden in the walls. And on that side you see more lateral bracing hitting the wall. And on that quadrant you see another lateral bracing that's hi hidden in the wall. So by separating the forces, vertical and lateral, you make the members do what they only want to do and don't make them do redundant things and make the members get bigger. So that was the whole idea with that. Uh, this uh, shows the deflection criteria. You see on the left, it, the deflection is, is exaggerated. So you begin to see what's happening with the roof. And the reason why this is so important is because we have glass underneath it and we didn't want the steel hitting the glass. And the roof structure is so thin that every single millimeter counted. On the right, you see the moment forces. So where the red is, you see the upward forces at the columns and on the yellow, you see the the deflection forces down. So it kind of gives you an idea of where the stresses and strains are, and that gives us an idea of, well, how, do we, how are we gonna construct this and where, where's our tension gonna go? Uh, that's the actual built uh, roof structure before all the decking goes down. So you can see how the girders are moving back and forth to follow the columns, and the columns are following the volumes. Uh, this is a, a, a view from below. You can see how thin the columns are. You can see the pin connections. Uh, you see the, the rolled steel volume, which is purely, um, well, it has some vertical, but it's, it's the lateral load there. And then you see some of the diagonals over there, which is taking the lateral loads uh, hidden in the walls. This shows uh, more up close. You see how the girders are moving back and forth. You see the smaller columns with the pin connection. The other thing that we had to do to really reduce the complexity of the fabrication is that we have a girder and they're all in diagonals and you have a steel beam going into it, it's a diagonal connection. That means it's very complicated to do. You don't wanna do that in the field because first of all, it's way more costly and also it's prone to mistakes. 
So the girders had what's called stub outs, where the beams, about a three, four foot section of stub out is fabricated in the shop under really controlled conditions. It goes out to the field installed, and then the beams are connected on butt connections, which are very, very, or I would say very, but much easier to connect. So that's one way to think about how do you reduce the complexity, reduce the cost, help the schedule, because if the cost and schedule are not meeting what the client wants, then something's gonna be cut and it's likely gonna be the design. So as architects, you really, really have to be on top of that if you want your design to be built as you want it to be built. Um, uh, you can begin to see here these openings through the beams, or that's where all the uh, drain and piping lines go through. They had to be cut in the factory before going out into the field. Uh, you can see the thinness of the roof. I think I climbed up on a truck here, but you can see how that thin plane is. The rolled steel wall, you can see how thin it is. Um, and interesting enough, because it's so thin, it creates kind of like a, um, James Terrell type effect where the, the thickness of the wall is so small that actually you're beginning to see just the image itself. Uh, this is a structural analysis to make sure when we wanted to cut an opening through the steel, we have to make sure with the engineers that it's actually achievable. Uh, another aspect we really had to deal with was drainage rain uh, because it's technically a flat roof, but there are smaller pitches on top of the roof, and each drain point where you see the circle um, has a certain bay of rainwater that it can collect because it doesn't want to collect too much rainwater or else you're going to overload the drain. You're going to flood, you're going to flood the roof. So a field of drains had to be put in, but being that there's very few walls, we had to figure out where those drains drain through, and they drain through the opaque volumes, and there aren't that many of them. So what we had to do was figure out where all these drain penetrations happen. You see a drain there, goes to a, a wall location and drops down. You see in this picture here, drains also have to pitch gravity-wise. So here in this black pipe in the middle, you see it's going through the middle of the beam, but eight feet later it's pitched down, so now it's a little bit lower. It's starting to hit the bottom flange, so we have to reinforce that. Eight feet further, it's too low, we had to create a haunch. All this stuff had to be accounted for and done in the shop before it actually went into the field so that we knew exactly where all the conflicts would be. And the engineers actually helped, or didn't help, they actually made the fabrication drawing sets to show how all these penetrations were, were done. So it wasn't haphazard, it actually was planned for. Uh, you can see here, once the decking goes down, uh, you begin to sense how thin the columns are. Um, so all that effort actually helped because that's sort of what allows you to create the atmosphere, is you, you do have to kind of take charge and make these design decisions happen in reality by calculating it and accounting for it beforehand. And by having very, very thin columns, those columns tend to disappear. And that was really the whole point of it. Uh, this is an interior courtyard. Now the snow has come. Um, I do have a video here, but I'm reluctant to touch that. Um, but here, all the connections are um, riveted connections. So you can hear them and see them doing that, but I won't, I won't run the video here at this point. Do it? Okay, let's see if it goes. Uh, it doesn't, but maybe I'll go back, or I mean, I'll go back to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now this is um, a coordination drawing. It's of the roof. It shows the steel beams. It shows all the light fixtures that are recessed. Uh, it shows all the plumbing drain lines, all the electrical lines, everything in there. And when I look at it, it gives me a really, really big headache because I remember what we went through to do that. But that 24 inch, which is about this much, the roof structure housed everything in there. All the light fixtures, the beams, all the drain lines, the roof insulation, everything had to live in that 24 inches. So a lot of coordination had to be done in order to ensure 
that there was no conflicts in the field because once you have a conflict in the field, there's nothing you can do except maybe soft it down and then you'll lose this sort of the clean line of that roof. Uh, but I think through that all effort, you also have, this, have to have a sense of humor um, through that and really work with the team that you have. Uh, here, I walked in the construction site one day and uh, Pat, who's at the bottom mouse, who's holding everyone up, is the site manager. Um, and then here, myself, and the one reading out, I don't know, guys, something just doesn't seem right. Um, very funny, but that's kind of how we had to really, really work together to figure out the issues and the problems. And yes, there was fits and starts, and not everything is always perfect the first time around. So you really have to work with them, really uh, work with the team that you have, and bring all their strengths um, in to make these kinds of projects happen. Um, this is just a photograph of the team members. Uh, you have the, the engineers here on this side. You have the site, the site team up there. The one in, in the orange helmet is Pat. Um, he was this, uh, the, uh, the uh, superintendent. He actually worked on Frank Gehry's building on site um, in the 90s, and he told me in those days they didn't have 3D modeling, so he had a fax machine, a phone, some rudimentary drawings from uh, Frank Gehry's office before they had CATIA, and he had a physical model. So he actually measured the physical model to figure out the X, Y, Z points in space, connected them, uh, got on the fax, got on the phone, and that's how they made the building back in those days. So there's a lot of history in, in Toledo. Uh, you see the subcontractor meetings and coordination meetings, so you really have to kind of bring all the team together and work together as a unit in order to um, be able to pull these kinds of projects off. Uh, this image just shows the original intention and when the steel was done, over there you see that actually it is trying to work out, so that was very encouraging to see. Um, the other factor of the glass pavilion is the glass itself. So we made a series of different mock-ups. Uh, this is just the first large one. But in that mock-up, we tested up different glass, different silicone joints, uh, curtains, casework, light fixtures, everything was, this is basically our experimental chamber. It also allows the client to see and also allows Sejimani to see, it al allows the engineers and the contractors to see what we're really trying to do because a building is the beta version. Uh, for instance, Windows, when they come out with the new versions of Windows, they have a beta version and they have uh, select people troubleshoot it before they release it to the public. With a building, there is no beta version. The built version is the beta version. So you really have to make sure that that beta version is the correct one. Uh, you don't have second chances on this. So the, the mock-up was really important. Uh, it really allowed us to really understand the issues. Uh, here, Sergio Manisa, one of the mock-up meetings. You can see here we have concrete samples, many different kinds of concrete. We have, you see the casework in the back. You see light fixtures here. So it really was a, just like a working experimental chamber. The glass was Pilkington glass. Uh, it was, the raw glass comes from Austria, Pilkington, was shipped to China, to Shenzhen, by a company named Sanjin. And they uh, took on the project to make all our glass. Our specifications were uh, pretty stringent that only a few fabricators in the world could make them. So we really had to visit every one. The Sanjin glass was really the one that was within our price point because at $300 a square foot, you can't get glass from Europe because you've just broke the bank and you won't be able to pay for it. So, but Sanjin was really eager to work on this project. Um, so uh, it was a, a good uh, team member to have. Here you can see how the glass is made. It's actually fairly simple. You make these steel forms um, and actually you slump the glass into the form and that's how you make the curvature. Uh, you can see here the ovens on the side. This is where the slumped glass pulls out. Uh, we were checking the edges. In this case, we were looking at, at um, kind of like an over at the bottom. You see there's an overlap edge because we were looking at a certain detail. It didn't work. You see here it's a little bit curved there, so we, we nixed that idea. Uh, you see the finished glass pieces coming out of the ovens, inspection time. Uh, it's a low iron glass, so being that if you have many different layers of glass, after a certain point, 
you start seeing a lot of green. So it was very really important that we went with low iron so that you maintain as much clarity as possible. Meanwhile, on the job site, uh, we laid out all our glass volumes. There's a uh, stainless steel track that goes down. In that track is where the glass fits in. It's three inches thick, and that's also where you have the topping slab of the final finished uh, concrete floor. This drove them crazy because we were down to a sixteenth of an inch. And like really just, we went really, really, because we knew that if you don't hit it here and this glass comes in and something is off, we cannot change anything because the, at that time, the, the glass is already here from China, but also the concrete is already set. Uh, as I was explaining before, in the cavity spaces, we have radiant heating, so the radiant tubing is actually being installed here. This is where hot and cold um, fluids are run through to uh, create the radiant. Here you begin to see certain sections of the uh, glass volumes, the floor sections being poured. They're doing sections at a time, and you can see where the three inches comes from. Now the concrete slab, um, Although we had liked it initially, uh, the clients felt that the concrete slab was a little bit too cold in feel. They wanted something a little bit warmer. So terrazzo was being looked at, but terrazzo was way out of the budget. So we actually came up with an idea where we just grind the concrete down. So you actually expose the concrete, which is what terrazzo originally was back in the Roman days. And <coughs> by doing that, you expose the aggregate and you create kind of a richness into the floor. So I guess you can say it's like a poor man's terrazzo. Uh, this is what we needed to do to fit the budget, but we had the aesthetics and the design. I can see here uh, the grinding process. Uh, we had to grind around elements that were cast into the floor. These are floor closers. These are stainless steel portal frames. Um, everything had to be grinded down to actually create that terrazzo type feel. And this is the finished product. So. In, in the end, we were actually very, very happy with it because it, it gave a certain warmth and, tech and uh, materiality to the floor that it wouldn't have had if it were just plain concrete. As we move through the spaces, you can see how these tracks are left where the glass can fit in. And then we have to mirror that on the roof structure, so you have these uh, steel um, U-shaped channels that are mounted in place to allow for the glass to fit in. And they had to be lasered up. The floor and the ceilings had to match exactly. Um, and also, to install the glass, we realized that we have to sheetrock one part of the ceiling, but not the other because you can't get the glass into place because the glass are actually lifted in place. So it added a whole level of complexity to the glass install. Uh, you can see here the first panels going in. Um, because it's floor to ceiling glass and because the ceiling, uh, because there's no frame, uh, it was pretty challenging to bring in the glass to make sure it doesn't hit anything. And uh, you can see here the glass is put into place, drop down into the floor, but one side of the ceiling had to be open in order to actually rotate that gla glass into position. You can see here um, how small 24 inches is. The top of the glass is hidden in that steel track. There's a steel beam going over it, and the steel beams also deflect. And they also deflect at different times of the year because of temperature and also loads. So that steel beam is actually moving up and down um, above the glass. So th a huge amount of discussion went into tolerance. What does tolerance mean? How, what is an acceptable tolerance? Do you leave a half inch a gap there or do you leave two inches a gap there? Of course the contractors want to keep three inches there because it just makes it a lot easier. But in order to keep the 24 inches, I think it came down to about an inch and a half. So really we had to shave every single piece of, of, of um, material to actually ensure that that tolerance was there. And even after the fact, we did have to survey. Uh, you can see all the survey points to make sure that we are still maintaining our tolerances so that in under no given condition or any condition, the steel beams would come down and hit the top of the glass. 
Here during construction, you see how uh, some of the cavity spaces are filled in, but some of the interior spaces are not, and you begin to see the volumes taking place. Uh, this is actually a skylight that goes into the basement for conservation because they needed natural daylight to actually be able to um, work on their artwork. Um, at that point in time, um, I'm not sure if it's true anymore, but it, this was the largest um, contact type shape of round uh, skylight, uh, insulated skylight that was made in the world. Uh, and this is being gingerly lowered into place. And the glass detailing was quite um, intricate in order to create not chunky frames, but very clear and clean and elegant frames. Um, a lot of analysis and calculations went into it to really figure out, well, how do you create an elegant uh, detail? How do you allow a door hinge to go in there? But these doors are rather tall, so how do you how do these door hinges mount into small stainless steel fittings that can take the load of the swing of the door? Um, and the end product was it actually worked out pretty well. Uh, we did fine tune small little things like this, the gray silicone that you typically get uh, was, seemed a little bit too light in color, so Sergio Manisa requested that they be tinted a little bit grayer so they're closer to the stainless steel. And I think these little things actually help. They're like little, little steps along the way that actually create the sum of the whole. This is a floor closure where the glass door fits into a closing mechanism that helps regulate the opening and closing of it but we created these uh, stainless steel pans and we uh, poured the concrete into that. We grinded it out to allow the um, aggregate to show and these little um, screw holes that you see are actually adjustment, uh, adjustment points for the door closer. You can see here in another glass portal, the, the team that was installing. And I have to say the, the work people in Toledo were quite amazing. Um, a lot of them said that their grandfathers or even great grandfathers worked on the original museum. So I think there was a lot of sense of pride and they really put everything into it. And I think these are the kinds of teams that you, you need to put together in order to pull together these kinds of projects because the typical building is done in a typical manner. They don't wanna, no one wants to think too hard to make it. They just wanna do it be done, leave at 3 p.m. in the afternoon and come back the next day and keep doing it. But these projects are much more than that. So you really have to make a, uh, uh, a good connection with everyone that's on the projects in order to ensure that what you design and the intricate designs that architects like to do can actually be feasible. And not only just feasible, actually done really well. Uh, these are the, the volumes of glass starting to take place. And one of the points I actually did want to bring up is that the office is very hands-on. Uh, Sano's office in Japan, the, the architect actually gets assigned to the construction site, so they're there every single day. They're part of the construction team. And we work very hands-on. We always work in um, not 3D, but actually th actual physical models. And those physical models actually, you begin to see the reality of the, um, the volumes and the spaces you create because 3D renderings can be deceptive. Um, you don't actually see everything that a th actual three-dimensional model um, can show you. But to carry that process through, we also do a lot of hand drawings, a lot of sketches because computer-generated uh, Construction drawings are pretty dry, um, but once you start doing hand drawings, you begin communicating to the actual work people and they understand it much more. They see that someone actually took the effort to draw it by hand to make it understandable for them to understand what are the real important points. So a lot of these hand drawings, we had hundreds and hundreds of hand drawings, sketches back and forth so that they can understand, the actual people who are making it can understand and I think maybe feel a connection to what the details are uh, this is um, in the museum. Uh, the stainless steel posts are actually thermostats and humidifiers because when you have all glass walls, there's nowhere to actually mount uh, 
humidi <laughs> humidity sensors and thermostats because there's no wall to put it on except the glass. So we came up with this idea of creating a post. Obviously beforehand we had to run the conduit in the glass, uh, in the concrete before it was poured. But it's essentially a, a, a stainless steel post with the wiring running through and um, we had to get sign off from the manufacturer, the thermostat manufacturer, that it will work. And we came up with this idea is that the top of the post is removable, but we can drill holes through it to create a kind of uh, uh, ability for the air to filter through. And because it was custom made, we weren't sure who can actually do it, but the actually steel fabricators on site looked at the drawing and said, I, my dad has a, a drill press, I think I can do this, but you owe me a case of beer. And um, that's how it came about. And he was able to do it. It was made it really um, beautifully. And so these are sort of the conversations and sort of the hap happenstance sort of events that happen on the job site. And I if you believe in them and they believe in you, these kinds of things can happen. I think if we went out and actually bid this out to a real high-end steel contractor, it would have probably cost five times more than what he charged us. Um, again, these are, this is a door in the hot shop. Um, we did a lot of little s sketches and hand drawings to really show exactly what we were thinking of. The little um, uh, levers and everything, make sure that they understood when they're fabricating it what attention is required to make it because you only want to make it once. And you want to only make it once and you also want to make it well. Uh, and then one day I was actually going through the hot shop and I saw the hand sketches and how those uh, glass workers uh, work and I realized perhaps there is a sensibility in the hand sketches, there's a certain humanity in it and that relating that humanity is a human process. Um, it, 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 it takes uh, more than just construction drawings to communicate that and I think also uh, SANA being a Japanese office operating all across the world, uh, operating in this instance in Toledo, Ohio, it was very important that a lot of these ideas get communicated because architecture is not black and white, it's actually very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's all colors. And those colors, a red to one person might mean something different to a different person. So as architects, if you have a design and you really want to make sure that it's built exactly how you want it to do, you have to communicate that um, in some manner. And I do think the best architects are the best communicators because they somehow get those ideas through and they can somehow get the people who are in the field to make it that way. Um, and you also learn in the process because you learn from them and then you also have to adjust because not everything is always possible. I and mean, then just to finish off, um, I'm just going back to the original model uh, photographs of the um, original intention and then superimpose that over the actual built. So when the model and the actual are very, very close, you know that your original intention was actually really carried out. Uh, this is again the model photo of the courtyard. Um, this is the built. Um, and that's actually another sort of comment I we received from different architecture critics is that it's quite rare to see an actual initial model or render be built almost identical to, um, or to be a, a built building be built very close to the original intention because so many things happen along the way that a lot of times are completely out of your control. But the more you can address those challenges and communicate the idea and work with the teams, the better you'll be able to make your ideas uh, come true. Uh, these are sort of the initial uh, insulation of the glass, you can see how the natural daylight comes through, so all those daylight studies did actually help. Um, all the headaches that we went through to make sure the steel can span and, uh, and all the conflicts that we were able to address beforehand helped because we were able to make this. And you hardly see any columns uh, because they're very tiny. And also I think um, the other thing that's quite important about architecture is that the building itself is maybe more of a vessel. The, the, the real, um, uh, I think, power in architecture is actually 
the atmosphere that you create for the people who are inhabiting it and what they feel, the emotions that they feel, because that creates a emotional impact on them. So in here, the hotshop workers who are making their glass get to experience making hotshops, not in a, a hot gl glass, not in a dungeon garage, but actually make it here. They can see the, the day, they can see the leaves, they can see the sky, they can see the people walking back and forth. Uh, and the glass itself, um, being that it's curved, it's very soft. When glass is flat, there's a tendency that even though it's polished smooth, there's a kind of a hardness to it. But when glass is curved, the way that the daylight hits it is very soft. It's almost like water. So these are um, <coughs> sort of kind of human, I guess, design considerations that are filtered into the, into the actual architecture. And going back to the idea of humanity is that the activities are on display to the public. The public can actually enjoy it. So here you have them making glass, but then you can have the public just be outside the building and actually watch it. So there's a transparency, not just in material, but also in program. And by having a transparency in program, I think the architecture goes to a different level because now you're talking about a kind of like a human communication as opposed to just the building itself. Uh, this is a view from the outside where the spectators are just walking by and can see the activities in the hot shop. Uh, within the spaces from the main corridor, you can actually see the activities that are happening, the demonstrations, the glass making that's happening. From inside, you can actually see out, and you can actually see back to the glass galleries of what's being exhibited as you're making the glass. So there's this um, transparency of program. And at nighttime, the glass flips and becomes like a lantern. So now the reflections are gone, but you actually see even more the interior. So that's another thing about glass is it's really a play on the light levels on each side of the glass. During the day, it becomes kind of reflective because you, it reflects the outside, but at nighttime it becomes very, very transparent because you can see right in. Um, and also the nuances, the reflections, uh, just the, the, um, the feelings of the day that's reflected in the glass. And to finish off, again, it just goes back to the original idea that the pavilion is really just living underneath the canopy of the trees. And um, it's not trying to make a big statement, but it's just there uh, to enjoy hopefully, uh, life and allow the users um, to be able to see into the building and have a, uh, a transparency of program where they can also feel a part of the museum. It's not this elitist institution where you don't know what's going on inside. It actually, you can see inside and it's inviting. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I think I did well on time, so if there's questions, um, I can. Oh, okay, yes, 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 yes. Uh, so let me see if I can, uh, is it this one? Oh, this is the one at, in the winter time. They're welding the uh, plate steel wall. That noise hearing is the rivets. They're having the rivet gun. You dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig. Yeah, so the, the the workers were out there um, in all kinds of weather, just making sure that the building is built towards the specifications. And again, I think it's if you make that connection, people want to see that vision through, so they actually work very hard to make it happen. So, any questions? Yes? Yeah, I wonder if you could hold on to that. Let me. I just wanted to call up, walk all the way up. I'm happy to do it up and down and all around and get an exercise, but this is awesome because it's really starting to allow you to see it. Thanks, Rob. Um, my question is, I wonder if in the office during design, after design, 
you all had a chance to reflect on how complex the building had to be in order to make it look so incredibly simple. Um, I think, I think there was some sense, because it's not the first building that Sana has done. I mean, they've done other glass buildings. So I think there was a sort of sense, but it's also a journey. You never know how complex it is until you're actually in it. And then as you start unfolding the layers, new complexities happen, and then you have to address it. So the answer to that question is no, I don't think there was an idea of how complex it, it is, but whatever happened or whatever came about, I think there was always sort of this drive to not be deterred, but actually figure it out because everything has an answer. Every, you, you can't solve everything. It's just like how much effort do you want to put into it? So I think I saw another question over here. Yeah, right over here. Yeah. <laughs> With the, <clears throat> with the climate change and the growing uh, damage from storms, I, I'm wondering how you would test uh, a torrential rainstorm in a concentrated area like right over your museum or, or a very heavy snowfall onto the roof. How, how, how do you actually test to make sure that the water's all picked up by those drains? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, th um, the engineers, in, in this case, a plumbing engineer was Cosentini. Uh, they run scenarios, 100-year um, storms. They run scenarios where you have a lot of rainwater coming through. And at a certain point, because it is a, a relatively flat roof, if it starts filling up, it's going to go over the edge. We have no parapets where you're creating a pool. So... Um, the roof load can accommodate that. Ideally, you don't want that to happen, but uh, the drain pipe diameters were made as big as possible. Um, I do remember kind of like yelling matches in the offices saying, we got to make this smaller, it doesn't fit, and the engineers saying, well, the hell, your toilets are going to overflow, you got to keep this. And so there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, uh, we had to look at a lot of clean outs, just making sure you can also maintain those pipes. So yeah, I mean, I think the way to go about that is you have to run the scenarios. You have to run the worst case scenarios with it. And with snow, uh, the snow loads, um, Toledo is very cold, so snow and ice loads are imposed on the roof structure. Uh, there's always a, um, a uh, buffer zone to make sure whatever worst case scenario, there's still a little bit more. But we also found that um, snow tends to not uh, accumulate on a flat roof because you have a lot of wind. A snow tends to accumulate when you have objects that stop the snow. So if you have a flat roof with no parapets, the snow tends to go off. So not to say that that's what it was designed for, that you wouldn't have any snow, because snow can also freeze and become ice. So all those scenarios had to be taken into account and that was always kind of a challenge with the engineers because they're always taking the worst case scenarios and, and here as an architect, you're always trying to reduce them, make it as thin as possible. So you have to find that balance. And at the end of the day, you do have to listen to the engineer and you do have to address the worst case scenarios. So. I can ask a question now too. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. also if there's anyone online that has questions, yeah. It sounds like there might be one, but I'll ask a question first. Uh, it was it was interesting to see your presentation because I think I had always, this is a case study that I would use when I taught a construction class, and I talked about kind of evacuating as much as possible out of the roof, and I think you having lived it talked about the complexity of all of the things in the roof. For one, like the mechanical system is comes from below and almost never interacts with the roof. But the one thing that, that um, confused me for a long time until I really started to learn about it was what I thought was a was a kind of tricky detail in that the metal decking doesn't run continuously correct over yeah. the top and, and probably shaved 
two inches out of the thickness or something. And so maybe yeah. you can talk about it. So, it so typically you have your main girders. Your main girders are the primary uh, support beams that the comms are based on, and they're big. Uh, you saw in, in, so yeah, here, these are your main girders. They're very big, and your beams are, are smaller. So the girders take up more height. Uh, but typically in construction, you take a top point, the girder is set and all the beams are set so that you can put the decking on top on an even plane. That's your normal way of doing it. Um, it makes sense, but you don't have to do it that way just because the contra contractors are telling you to do it that way. So it, in a sense, by doing that, we were sort of like wasting uh, space. So we did the opposite. We set it below. The beams, the, the smaller beams were set below, so the girders were sticking up. So the decking had to be cut around the girders, which actually wasn't that big of a deal. We just had to make sure that the waterproofing and also the insulation and then the final waterproofing on top of that is maintained. So it's just out of the box thinking, but um, it's not unheard of. And just because someone tells you that's the way we've been always doing it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it that way. So that's the th kind of thing is everything had to be looked at and really thought again as to why we are doing it and why, sh why we should do it that way. And if you uncover certain things and pick up another two inches, then that's another two inches that um, you don't have to waste. The, the other one too, maybe I'll do it, but I come over to see the online question. Um, and we, I think we, I caught glimpses of it when the foundation was happening, but being at the glass museum, I was always intrigued by this curious set of bushes that was out in the middle of the grass. And it's, uh, I think it's a fire stair that comes up from below that, that oh, emerges yeah, yeah, in the yeah. middle of the yard. Right? Yeah. And so just the fact, I love hearing all the stories from you about, because, and maybe what students don't realize is no matter the architect, right, Sana had to follow all the same building code. Correct. So there has to be two means of egress. There has to be yes. all of these things there, and, and all of the issues seem to be solved in really unique and interesting ways. Correct. That was an egress stair, and um, we just made sure that if you have to have an egress stair, you do it as best as you possibly can. So um, yes, that's that's the rationale behind that. So the the simplest thing, the simplest question is how long did the project take to complete? Maybe design stages and then? Uh, started in 2000. It was, I think, 2003, at the end of 2003 or early 2004, the construction started and it finished in 2005. Um, so um, a total of five years. And yeah. the other question that came from our line was, was a question just about maybe how you balance the um, energy demands of a building and the transparency of it. Or maybe when we're, you, you talked a little bit about this, but the, you know, I think we're taught that, that windows and glass are bad in terms of energy. Yeah, I mean, that's why um, so much uh, effort went into the cavity. I'm not sure if you remember that pure air storm and the radiant concepts is that uh, you need to reduce your energy waste as much as you possibly can. Um, and it's not just for the sake of reducing it because by reducing it, you're also reducing the loads, you're reducing the equipment, you're re reducing the duct sizes. And by doing that, things don't have to be so big and chunky. So um, energy load uh, is really, seriously thought about because without it, um, you're gonna be in big trouble. So that, hence, that's why all the, the analysis by TransSolar happened, um, all the lighting analysis by Arup was taken into, uh, into consideration because of the heat gain from direct sunlight. Um, and there even was funny conversations between, TransSolar is German, uh, they have a much smaller um, buffer zone, I, I forget what the amount, I think it's like 3% or something waste. Whereas the US engineers had something much bigger, like 15%. So at a certain point when the construction drawings were done, uh, Trent Solar I think was in the office and he started saying, what the heck is going on? Why is there so much waste? And it's like, well, that's how 
it's done in the United States. And so it, I think there's also different perceptions of energy waste and usage depending on the countries too. Thank you so much. So interesting to hear uh, so much about a building I know very well. Um, but my question is from the curatorial perspective, not the architect uh, perspective. And it's, you had an image of these kind of circular glass cases for the display of objects. And I'm curious if you would speak a little bit about the involvement, not just of, um, of Sana in the building of the building, but in, in terms of their design for the display of objects. How involved were they? Did they pull back? Did TMA kind of come in and start well, to assert their desires? Those were initial ideas of possibilities, um, but there was um, uh, uh, a casework designer brought in who really knew the nuts and bolts of it. And um, so we had to work with them and the museum had to work with them. So the casework that you see now is the result of that. Um, yes, it's true. It doesn't look so much like Sana casework because it's a different um, designer that did that. But they're also experts in casework, and uh, you know they knew much more about the specifics of how do you exhibit, how do you light, how do you control the temperatures, which manufacturers should you use. So, yeah, I mean there was definitely some back and forth. There was some um, conversations and opinions on what they should be, but ultimately you do have to. Um, trust the people that you bring on board and um, uh, and basically make the best, uh, uh, make sure that the items are displayed in the best possible manner. So. I like the carved ones too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to get your steps in there. Uh, so I, I'm really curious about a building that is so clean with such tight tolerances and such thin profile for running all your mechanical. What thought process is going to how to maintain that over time? And did you have to do anything special to provide access panels or ways to replace things when they do break down? Yeah, I, uh, there are access panels around. You don't see them so well because we hid them as much as we can. Um, but accessibility is always uh, something you do need to take into consideration. Um, I mean, one, sheetrock is also accessible too. I mean, you do, if you look around closely, you'll see panels around uh, where uh, we specifically needed them because maybe there are gonna be higher maintenance and um, but as of any building, like you see here, there's sheetrock. If there's something that goes wrong, you do have to cut a hole in it. So in that respect, uh, accessibility um, was thought about on many different levels. Um, but being that there's a lot of equipment there and uh, some of the equipment need maintenance, um, the accessibility was talked about to a very, very high degree. Um, and clean outs, and also, a lot of the mechanical equipment is actually in the basement where you don't see it. So if you go down there, it's actually very well maintained. I saw it today. Um, and you can actually access that. And there's actually, at least I feel, quite a bit of space down there in order for that to happen. So and that's, I guess, the part of the design process is how do you make it efficient so that the things that need to be, let's say, like dirty and maintained or maybe in the basement or out of the way so that the workers can do what they need to do and not have to worry about, well, how much maintenance do you have to do because people can see it. We had another question from online, one of our students, John. John, how are you doing? It's good to know that you're watching on YouTube. Um, he loved the detail for the humidity sensor and the way that you solved it, and he was curious if there were other things that came up during construction that you had to find compromises to that, he didn't say this, but I guess I'd be curious that could be solved with a case of beer. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, 
I mean, that's a more dramatic story, I would say. Um, and it's a very simple story to tell, and it's also graphically easy to show. But I think there's varying levels of that through everything. Um, the, uh, the glass insulation was very tricky, so we had to work with the installers to figure out how do you um, inject the silicone in, and is it by hand, is it by a, a, a wood block, and um, so all these sort of things have to happen in the field, and you have to find the right method to do it because work because it works on my computer, right? It works on paper. But the actual person is doing the work says, okay, well, let me show you how it's done. Or let me show you what you're telling me to do, and he does it. And it's like, okay, that doesn't work. <laughs> so then what are we going to do to make it work? And they say, well, I think maybe, I understand what you're trying to do, but maybe we do it in this way, and let me try it. Okay, so it doesn't work. Let me try it again. I'll get back to you next week. And if they're really into the project, they will probably somehow figure it out. And uh, I think basically everything in the building was really like that. Uh, except the stuff that maybe the equipment that was bought from a manufacturer that comes ready made, uh, that just needs to be installed and plugged in. But there are so many, so many things that had to be discussed on site uh, with the workers. And actually things evolved because of that too, because they told us it wasn't possible or they had a better idea. So that was a kind of an everyday conversation. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you deal with the um, seasonal expansion contraction with the glass? I know you talked about that like low tolerance, but if you get so low, you might, I'm afraid it might crack that glass. But you're talking just the glass itself? Yeah. Well, but you could touch on both. Like, I mean, the glass itself, we, we tested everything. Um, it's uh, anneal laminated glass, and because of the cavity spaces, it doesn't have to bridge ice cold outside to warm inside because of the cavity, so there's gradients that it goes through. So the glass itself was actually not so difficult. The single pane doors are tempered, so they have a much higher um, performance criteria, so they can actually do that. Um, what you're probably talking about is really more the uh, building moves. I mean, it, it, is, it is steel, so in the winter time it contracts, and in the summertime it expands. So that was really what I was talking about, tolerances, is, is what are the expansion tolerances? You engineer, can you tell me, is this a real tolerance that you're talking about, or is this something you pulled out of a textbook and just telling me that it is? And so there was a lot of conversations like that. Um, please define what your tolerance is, and please show us what you really mean because we want to make sure that first it's addressed, but it's not also uh, some random number that just everyone uses but no one ever thought about. Thank you. Well, seeing any other hands? I think it's just a, it's an amazing, well, it's an amazing building that many of us live close to and we visit many times. And it's just amazing to hear your narrative related to it about how much, maybe back to Martin's first question, like the, the amount of design work that went into it, the lighting, the engineering, all of those types of things to figure it out, and then to also hear about the kind of compromises and the craft that occurs on site to make the thing possible too. And so it's amazing to see the behind the scenes and to have you here to share that with us. So thank you very much for coming.